welcome to my mommy's podcast. This episode is sponsored by Just Thrive Probiotics. I found this company when searching for the most research-backed and effective probiotic available, and I was blown away at the difference I found in their products. They offer two cornerstone products that are both clinically studied and highly effective. The first is their probiotic, which has been studied to help with leaky gut and to survive up to 1,000 times as much as other probiotics or as the beneficial organisms in something like grape yogurt, for instance. The difference is their spore-based strains work completely differently than other types of probiotics. Their probiotic is vegan, dairy-free, histamine-free, non-GMO, and is made without soy, dairy, sugar, salt, corn, tree nuts, or gluten. So it's safe for practically everyone. I even sprinkle it in my kids' food or bake it into products because it can survive at really high temperatures. Their probiotic contains a patented strain called Bacillus indicus HU36, which produces antioxidants in the digestive system where they can be easily absorbed by the body. Their other product is a K2-7, and this is a nutrient you may have heard of. It's known as Activator X, a super nutrient that Weston A. Price, a dentist known primarily for his theories on the relationship between nutrition, good health, bone development, and oral health, found. He found that this is prevalent in foods in the healthiest communities in the world. The K2 from Just Thrive is the only pharmaceutical grade all natural supplement with published safety studies. Like the probiotic, it is also gluten, dairy, soy, nut, and GMO free, and best are both taken with food, so I keep both on my kitchen table. Here's a tip too. My dad has trouble remembering to take supplements, so he actually taped these to his pepper shaker because he uses that at practically every meal, and now they're on his daily supplement list as well. You can check them out all their products and learn more by going to thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Wellness Mama and using the code Wellness Mama 15 to save 15%. So again, that's Thrive Probiotic, T H R I V E P R O B I O T I C dot com forward slash Wellness Mama and the code Wellness Mama 15 to save 15%. This episode is brought to you by Alatura Naturals Skincare. You guys loved the founder, Andy, when he came on this podcast to talk about his own healing journey after a tragic accident caused massive scarring on his face. From this experience, he developed some, some of the most potent and effective natural skincare options from serums and masks and a lot of products in between. The re- results are super visible on his perfectly clear skin that is free of scars. I personally love the mask and I use it a couple times a week and I often use their gold serum at night to nourish my skin while I sleep. All of their products have super clean ingredients and they really work. Andy is absolutely dedicated to creating the highest quality products possible and it shows. You can check them out at alaturanaturals.com forward slash wellness mama and use the discount code wellness to get 20% off. So again, that's Alatura Naturals. So A L I T U R A N A T U R A L S dot com forward slash wellness mama and the discount code wellness to save 20%. Hello, and welcome to the Wellness Mama podcast. I'm Katie from wellnessmama.com, and I am so excited about today's guest because I have wanted to interview Dr. Walter Longo for years. And in this episode, we go deep on fasting, and especially the fasting mimicking diet, which he has pioneered research on. Dr. Longo is the director of the Longevity Institute and professor of gerontology and biological sciences at the University of Southern California. He has made tremendous contributions in research related to longevity, aging, fasting, and metabolic disease. He is the inventor of the Fasting Mimicking Diet, which was granted the only patents in healthcare on promoting longevity and health span and on treating diabetes. So to say he is qualified would be a vast understatement. It's a tremendous honor to have him here, and I can't wait to share this interview with you. Dr. Longo, welcome, and thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me. I have wanted to chat with you probably for years. Uh, I've read your book and I think also several of your research papers and love what you're doing to help advance the field of longevity and all of your work related to fasting and the fasting mimicking diet. And I find there seems to be a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to fasting, especially now that it has 
started to really gain popularity. And you are indisputably one of the top experts in the world on this topic. So to start off, can you walk us through some of the high level effects and benefits of fasting in general? Yeah, so I I usually start by uh, saying that fasting doesn't mean anything. And um, it's kind of like saying eating, right? And and so um, there are many, many different things that you can eat. uh, And and so we usually don't use the word eating. Is eating good for you or not? And so the same same is true for fasting. So the the uh, what we've been focusing on is what we call periodic fasting and fasting mimicking diets, and and the other I, I think uh, very popular forms of fasting are uh, alternate day fasting, in which essentially people don't eat every other day, and then something called sixteen eight um, or time restricted eating or feeding, in which uh, the ex- uh, the period in which people don't eat is extended to anywhere from 12 to 16 hours per day. And there is also an, another one called 5-2, in which um, usually people uh, will have um, maybe a, around 500 calories two days a week, for two days a week, 500 calories instead of the normal number of calories. So um, so those are the, the major ones. And now there are, there are positive and negatives about um, all of them. And I think it's very important that we move away, particularly with, with fasting, uh, because it's so powerful and, 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 and it's very similar um, to, to medicine or, or certainly has a kind of uh, a powerful effect. And, and so I think we need to start describing exactly what are we talking about and what is it going to be used for or not. So, you know, fasting making diets, um, we moved away from water only fasting for a number of reasons, and but mostly our compliance and safety. Uh, so to to ask somebody to be let's say three, four, five days or a week on a water only fasting, this should only be done in a clinical setting uh, with doctors that are specialized. Uh, so we we and even then it's not clear that that's beneficial. Uh, so we are now focusing on the use of of these uh, fasting mimicking diets, and these are um, anywhere from three, four hundred calories a day to 1100 calories a day, depending on the use. And they can last from three or four days minimum to uh, about seven days is the, the longest uh, version that we've been using, for example, for uh, autoimmunity uh, trials. That's so fascinating. And I'm sure very appealing to a lot of people listening, the idea of being able to do something that mimics the effects of fasting without having to actually not consume any food whatsoever. Can you go a little deeper to explain how that works? Like, how are we able to get some of those same benefits while still consuming calories? Yeah, so the, um, I've been uh, working on this for, for uh, decades. And and one my uh, mentor at UCLA, uh, you know, back in uh, over uh, 25 years ago, was Roy Walford. And Roy was the, uh, uh, the world leading expert on something called calorie restriction. And so calorie restriction is just a, an extended uh, um, restriction of calories by about 30%. And from the beginning, it was very clear that calorie restriction was very beneficial, but also very detrimental. So it caused lots of benefits and lots of problems. Uh, so since then, I've been thinking, how do, how do we get the benefits and possibly even more than the benefits of calorie restriction without the problems? And so the, the fasting making diet, th- then after that, I started really uh, focusing on the genes that control aging and diseases and spent you know, a good 15 years just searching and identifying some of the, the key genes that uh, we now know to be controlling the lifespan of, of, of mice. Uh, but also uh, the, certainly the health span of, of people. So we've been following this group in Ecuador, for example, that a genetic mutation that are, are uh, um, apparently allowing them to live uh, relatively disease-free. So the, uh, first the identification of the genes, and then eventually the fasting-making diet was developed to regulate this, these genes so that these genes can then regulate aging, and uh, diseases. So, of course, we cannot intervene. It's, it's, right now, we, there is no, there are no drugs that that are uh, are known to uh, affect lifespan. Um, and so, diet and nutrition, uh, whether it's the everyday nutrition or the periodic uh, fasting mimicking diet, is probably the best way to regulate these genes. Right. So, so how does it work? Basically, I call it something I call nutri technology. 
which is the understanding, for example, uh, we know the proteins and certain amino acids within those proteins that you eat, uh, the people eat every day, they control uh, growth hormone levels, they control the levels of something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, and then downstream of it, they control something called TOR. And all those are now widely accepted to be uh, regulating the, the, the speed at which people age, and not just the, the aging, but also uh, diseases. And uh, on the other side, there's uh, the sugars control pathway, a gene called PKA. And so we use our understanding of this connection between nutrients and genes to then develop this fasting mimicking diet so we can, in, in many ways, orchestrate uh, the, the, the changes in the body so that we switch the body into this uh, highly protected mode, um, not just during the diet, but also in the months following the diet. So the, the idea is intervening for, let's say, five days. Uh, this is what we've been shown in a clinical trial uh, a couple of years ago, intervene for five days, and then uh, these, these effects of the fasting making diet uh, can, can last uh, potentially months. Bless you. That's amazing. And you mentioned autoimmunity. And definitely, there's a sector of the audience listening right now that has some form of autoimmune disease. So based on the research and what you've found over the years, what is that connection? Or how can fasting potentially be beneficial for certain autoimmune conditions? Yes. So we now publish several papers uh, one uh, with uh, a mouse model of multiple sclerosis and one uh, a mouse model for inflama- inflammatory bowel disease. But both of them had also uh, human clinical trials um, that they were um, testing uh, the fasting making diet. And so, but in mice, we were, we were able to um, look at mechanisms. So, how does it work? And so, it looks at like the, the, for the, in the case of multiple sclerosis, the fasting making diet uh, cycles could uh, reduce or sometimes even eliminate multiple sclerosis uh, effects. And they did so by, in part, uh, foc- uh, intervening on the inflammation and, and, the, and the ability of lymphocytes to attack the normal cells uh, of the spinal cord. And on the other side, the, the cycles of the fasting making that they're feeding uh, were basically activating these uh, oligodendrocytes, precursor cells, and so essentially regenerating, promoting the regeneration of the myelin-producing uh, cells uh, to, to reverse the effects of, of uh, multiple sclerosis in the mouse. And then in humans, uh, um, in the trial, we showed that, in fact, uh, the quality of life was improved. Um, this was a 45-people uh, preliminary clinical trial, but certainly very promising to already see uh, a single cycle, by the way, of the, uh, a week-long single cycle of the fasting-making diet able to improve the quality of life of, of the patients, uh, the, of the multiple sclerosis patients. And then the other uh, study that we published just a, a few weeks ago uh, was with inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's colitis. And, uh, and there we saw very similar effects. So on one side, uh, acting, uh, the FMD acts on inflammation and autoimmunity, and on the other side, acts on the stem cell uh, and uh, repair. And um, the interesting thing here was that uh, when we looked at water-only fasting, it didn't work uh, very well. And, and so um, it looks like, the, as we had always suspected, that the, the, con- the vegan content of the diet is helping, is uh, cooperating with fasting to uh, promote regeneration and anti-inflammatory effects in the gut, and in, in part, at least, by uh, changing the, the uh, microbiota, so the microbial population in the gut, uh, and changing it from a, a pro-inflammatory uh, kind to anti-inflammatory kind. So it's interesting now that by connecting these, these two worlds that we always operated in, one was the fasting, but one was also you know, vegan, pescatarian diets, you know, these diets, these everyday diets that the people that are very long-lived, they've always consumed. And so it was, uh, you know, we now realize how good that, that idea was because uh, it seemed like the, the prebiotic content of these vegetables is allowing the fasting refeeding to promote the growth of protective bacteria and, and remove the, the, the bad bacteria from the gut. 
That makes sense. And I know I've read some sources have con- potential concerns with water fasting having a negative effect on the gut. So it makes sense that that could kind of mitigate that the risk of that. I'm curious when comparing in the research water fasting with a fasting mimicking diet, and of course, like you mentioned, compliance would be much better in a fasting mimicking diet. But are there any benefits that people can get from water fasting only that they would not be able to get from fasting fasting mimicking diets? Or do you really see pretty comparable results? Well, not only comparable, we see better results, as I just mentioned, uh, with the fasting making diet. So now you have a, an issue of safety with the water-only fasting, uh, compliance, and efficacy, right? So, so clearly, uh, you know, we need to move away from water-only fasting. Um, you know, for example, water-only fasting is associated with uh, increased gallstone formation and, and the uh, and the potential for needing the gallbladder removed. Uh, it can lead to hypotension, hypoglycemia, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I mean, in the beginning, we, of course, did lots of work with mice and, and water-only fasting. Uh, but then we realized uh, very quickly uh, in our cancer trials, uh, but in general, that water-only fasting was not a good idea for, for patients and, um, and that we needed to move uh, to a, uh, uh, a fasting-mimicking diet uh, regimen um, also to standardize the right? rest and standardize uh, uh, the number of calories and making sure that uh, we can say uh, we've tested this on, on you know, three, four hundred, sometimes uh, even more uh, patients. And um, as, as it happened now for cancer, there's going to be about, uh, you know, three or four hundred patients now that have received the, the fasting mimicking diet uh, in combination with chemotherapy and other therapies. And so that will allow us to... Uh, to standardize, but also just the regular people, the people that don't have any diseases. Um, they, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we don't endanger, uh, we don't put people in, in a dangerous situation so that they can save, uh, you know, three or four hundred dollars a year. I think it's it, it's much better uh, to do a small investment and um, and uh, be safe and, and really get the effects and eventually. I hope these fasting making diets will be reimbursed uh, by insurances and and uh, et cetera. So hopefully uh, people soon enough will get them for free. Let's talk about the cancer side a little bit more because that's certainly one area where I've seen a lot of published research, both from you and from other researchers, on the the very much benefits of fasting in some form, fasting mimicking diets, especially for cancer outcomes. Can you explain some of the reasons why there's such a correlation there? Well, the reason um, is twofold, and and one is the protection of the normal cells. You know, we don't realize that many patients are not killed by the uh, by the cancer; they're killed by the the treatment, and and, and that's okay. I mean, in, I mean, I'm not trying to attack the the, the system because uh, there are desperate times, uh, desperate measures, but certainly you can see how if we protected the uh, uh, the normal cells that that treatment could become much, much more effective um, because now you'd be able to continue the treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So that was our original focus, you know, maybe 12, 13 years ago, was how do we protect the normal cells and not the cancer cells, with something we call um, differential stress sensitization. And, and clearly succeeded in that uh, in mice and then at the several clinical trials that were published, all suggesting that, in fact, this happens uh, in humans uh, um, uh, that are receiving chemotherapy. A- and then the focus switched to what we call differential stress sensitization, meaning that, okay, the, the normal cells get protected during, during the fasting making diet and the cancer cells don't. But um, what about the toxicity of the chemotherapy to the, uh, to the cancer cells? Could we show that it's even higher? So could we show that the, the standard treatment is more effective against the cancer cells, independently of the normal cells. And, uh, and that's what we showed uh, in, in many, many papers that, in fact, when uh, the cancer cell is faced with chemotherapy or other treatment, it's already in a very panic, stressful situation. And so when it gets into that, in that panic uh, uh, emergency situation, it looks for nutrients which allow it to uh, escape that situation, right? For example, you know, sugar being, being one of the major ones. So when, when the cancer cell is faced with, with the toxins, the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, et cetera, 
it, it often looks for sugar to uh, generate all the things that now need to generate at a higher rate to repair and replace, et cetera, et cetera. So if the sugar is, is down, now it's got a problem. Now, the, the fasting making diet is not just acting on sugar. It's acting on sugar, IGF-1, and insulin, and ketone bodies, and leptin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's essentially generating a very hostile environment, particularly when you're receiving treatment, and this treatment is imposing uh, already a difficult situation to begin with. So it's, it's on one side, the chemo or, or the kinase inhibitor or the hormone therapy, et cetera, et cetera, are causing problems for the cancer. And, and now the cancer can go into this emergency mode and utilize all these nutrients to save itself. But if those are now altered, especially if they're reduced in most cases, but in some cases like ketone bodies, it could be that even if they're increased, now the, the, the cancer has a much higher, uh, much more difficult time surviving. And this is why we see with many cancers, if we, in mice, and now we're, uh, we also have human data, if you add the chemotherapy alone, you see very little uh, cancer-free survival. If you add the fasting mimicking diet alone, it's about as good as chemotherapy, but you see very little cancer-free survival. And then when you combine the chemotherapy and the fasting making diet, that's when you see lots of uh, mice becoming completely cancer-free. And now, soon enough, we're going to be publishing the data from uh, breast cancer patients, um, suggesting that the same is true for, for patients. That's incredible. And Based on your research, it would seem that there's also a very protective mechanism with fasting for those who don't have cancer, which hopefully most people listening do not. But what does the actual data say as far as if you can implement a fasting mimicking diet? Does that actually potentially reduce the risk of cancer as well? Those technically, it, it's um, it's difficult to say it reduces the the chances of cancer, but certainly in the clinical trial that we published a few years ago. We see that patients that, let's say, were pre-diabetic um, had a, a major reduction in fasting glucose. Patients that had high levels of IGF-1, which is now being associated, this growth factor that I mentioned earlier, has been associated with many different, different types of cancers, uh, they had a, a big reduction in this IGF-1. And uh, inflammation, which is also associated with many cancers, that uh, was reduced, you know, C-reactive protein. Um, so, so in, in central adiposity, which is now considered one of the, um, the major risk factor, so you know, belly fat and visceral fat, one of the major risk factors for cancer, I think something recently uh, put it in number two uh, behind smoking as the, um, as the uh, highest uh, risk factor for cancer. Uh, so that's reduced, right? So now if you take all that together, it's hard to imagine how you would not get protection from cancer by doing the fasting making diet, particularly if you have elevated uh, levels of these markers or risk factors. Now, it's not proven because, you know, to prove that, you'll have to do what we're doing right now, which is we're doing a, a preventive trial on, on BRCA1, BRCA2. Women that have this, uh, like Angelina Jolie, have this high risk for breast cancer because of, of genetics. And they do not um, t- uh, do uh, mastectomy. Um, so we're following them. And, you know, this is going to take a very long time to figure it out. But we're going to do it both in the, in the mouse model. And we're now um, recruiting patients in, in southern Italy. And so uh, clinical trial basically is going to uh, look at what is the, the um, incidence of breast cancer in those on the fasting making diet versus those that uh, don't do the fasting making diet once a month. That makes sense. And yeah, that's amazing that you guys are doing that research. And in your book, The Longevity Diet, you talk about something called the five pillars. And I'd love if you could explain what those are and then talk about why those are so important for us to understand when we're evaluating research and claims. Because as you know, I'm sure very well, there's so many claims on the internet people make related to different health outcomes. So can you explain the five pillars? Yeah, so the, the five pillars um, I try to, uh, so they're epidemiological studies, clinical studies, uh, basic research, centenarian studies, and uh, studies of complex systems. And the idea um, was that everybody 
in the world is now writing book about it, it's interesting because this the two fields that i specialize in is everybody's an expert so nutrition and aging everybody's ages everybody eats and so therefore everybody has a book uh, on one of those two and this started generating uh, tremendous confusion uh, because people every other day you hear uh, you know is coffee is good and coffee is bad and alcohol is good and alcohol is bad and proteins are good and then bad so the, the idea of the five pillars was like when we go to court for, for major crimes, you know, the, the, the court system has developed, you know, somebody's accused of murder, there is a multi-pillar system. And it's been around for, for, for centuries uh, before you can, you can convict somebody uh, of, a, of a crime like that. And so the five pillars is trying to bring that kind of rigor to, the, um, to medicine and, and to you know, whether it's preventive or treatment. And so... If you say, for example, um, are proteins good or bad for you? Uh, well, let's start looking at it. Uh, what about centenarians around the world? Do they commonly have a high-protein diet or a low-protein diet? And if you look at some of the longest-lived people in the world, they very consistently had a low-protein diet. And they had a vegan, pescatarian, or mostly vegan, some meat, but not very often. Um, then you say, okay, well, what about animal studies? Um, do, does a high protein diet make uh, mice live longer or does a low protein diet make mice live longer? Well, very consistently, the low protein diet has been shown by many laboratories to make mice live longer. Uh, then you can say, okay, let's go look at uh, studies of populations, you know, epidemiological studies. So, you know, what about the Harvard studies that looked at nurses and doctors and the ones that have um, high proteins are in the ones versus the ones that have a low protein diet and other uh, studies by these uh, databases uh, like the Enhance by the CDC. And again, you see the people that have a low protein diet, at least up to age 65, 70, they do much better than those that have a high protein diet. And then finally, clinical studies. Um, what if you take a group and you put them on high protein, you take a group and you put them on low protein, uh, and then you follow them, uh, well, you see that, for example, the one on low protein, the IGF-1, the, the, the potential risk factor for cancer that I mentioned earlier, it goes much lower. And there's all kinds of other benefits that, that appear. Uh, so now you have four pillars in, 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 that, that are supporting this idea of at least up to age 65, 70, have a low protein diet, but sufficient, right? Not, you cannot be malnourished. You have to be low, but sufficient. And uh, yeah, so that's the approach. That's the multi-pillar system approach. And, and the fifth pillar is complex system. And, and I really always like to think about cars and planes in making decisions about, you cannot always use it, but, but in, in many cases you can use it. For example, you know, if you're thinking about, um, you know, shall I run uh, 100 miles a week or shall I run uh, 20 miles a week? Uh, well, if you think about a car, if you drove a car a thousand miles a week, you probably, uh, anybody will make the conclusion that um, you know, after 10 years, nobody will want to buy that car, right? So, so that's the fifth pillar. And, and now, in many cases, it can be used to sort of make prediction about um, eventually, uh, yes, if you, if you run 100 miles a week, your knees and, and your hips and et cetera, et cetera, and your feet are going to be damaged. So probably not such a good idea to, for, for a health span to be doing something excessively. So look for, for solutions that like biking, you know, for an hour every other day uh, may be a much better idea than, you know, than trying to run 50 miles a week. That makes sense. That's a great analogy. Um, I'm curious when it comes to protein requirements to go a little deeper on that. Um, can you, is there a clinical definition or a research definition of what low protein diet while still getting sufficient protein looks like? And then secondly, what happens to the data after age 65? What changes at that point? Yeah, so the standard by most uh, medical associations around the world, and including the World Health Organization, is um, uh, 0.8 grams. So it's about 0.35 uh, grams per pound of body weight per day, right? So if you weigh 100 pounds, most medical associations will say if you eat about 35 grams of protein to 37 grams of protein per day, that's very few people argue that. That's not uh, sufficient. Now, so that's uh, that's a minimum. Uh, now, after age sixty-five, probably what happens is that if you ask an eighty-year-old, 
uh, how much protein, proteins did you have today? And the 80 year old answer is very low. Let's say, you know, I just mentioned 0 0.35 grams per pound of body weight per day. If the, if the 80 year old answers 20 grams, they usually don't do very well. They have higher uh, cancer rates and higher overall mortality. Now, the suspicion is that they're just malnourished. They're not on a low protein diet. They're just not eating well. They're not, they're, they're maybe in a situation where they're frail, they're sick, and they're malnourished. Now, um, but at the same time, it is true that a little bit extra proteins and extra var variation uh, may be beneficial to a 60, 70, 80, 90 year old. Meaning that, for example, I uh, followed Emma Morano in Italy, and she became uh, the oldest person in the world and, and the oldest who ever lived in Italy. And Carlo Bava, I always tell the story that Carlo Bava, when she turned around 100 years of age, gave her 100 grams of raw meat per day. Right. So now 100 grams of raw meat per day is clearly not a good idea for somebody who's 50, 60, or even 70. But somebody just turned 100, I think he got it right. And, and she needed that sort of additional raw uh, nourishment um, that was beneficial. I think Carlo knew that she was a little bit anemic. And so that's how he intervened. Now, I'm not, that was his opinion. I'm not trying to uh, you know, tell people to, to, when they turn 100, uh, to start eating raw meat. But it's just probably not a bad idea, right? So, so then the idea is when you turn 65, 70, maybe starting to add uh, some more eggs to your diet. Uh, more, let's say, uh, goat yogurt uh, or, or some goat cheeses, some of these ingredients that are much more high, higher nourishment and they're also commonly associated with the um, longevity population, right? So goat milk and cheese and yogurt, you see it in, in, in various populations like Sardinia, Greece, et cetera, where uh, there is tendency to uh, live very long. So they're probably not bad for you. Otherwise, we would not have seen these, these record longevity uh, stories in these, uh, in these areas of the world. Got it. This episode is sponsored by Just Thrive Probiotics. I found this company when searching for the most research-backed and effective probiotic available. And I was blown away at the difference I found in their products. They offer two cornerstone products that are both clinically studied and highly effective. The first is their probiotic, which has been studied to help with leaky gut and to survive up to 1,000 times as much as other probiotics or as the beneficial organisms in something like Greek yogurt, for instance. The difference is their spore-based strains work completely differently than other types of probiotics. Their probiotic is vegan, dairy-free, histamine-free, non-GMO, and is made without soy, dairy, sugar, salt, corn, tree nuts, or gluten. So it's safe for practically everyone. I even sprinkle it in my kids' food or bake it into products because it can survive at really high temperatures. Their probiotic contains a patented strain called Bacillus indicus HU36, which produces antioxidants in the digestive system where they can be easily absorbed by the body. Their other product is a K2-7, and this is a nutrient you may have heard of. It's known as Activator X, a super nutrient that Weston A. Price, a dentist known primarily for his theories on the relationship between nutrition, good health, bone development, and oral health, found. He found that this is prevalent in foods in the healthiest communities in the world. The K2 from Just Thrive is the only pharmaceutical grade all natural supplement with published safety studies. Like the probiotic, it is also gluten, dairy, soy, nut, and GMO free, and best are both taken with food. So I keep both on my kitchen table. Here's a tip too. My dad has trouble remembering to take supplements. So he actually taped these to his pepper shaker because he uses that at practically every meal. And now they're on his daily supplement list as well. You can check out all of their products and learn more by going to thriveprobiotic.com forward slash wellness mama and using the code wellness mama 15 to save 15%. So again, that's thrive probiotic, T H R I V E. P R O B I O T I C dot com forward slash wellness mama and the code wellness mama 15 to save 15%. This episode is brought to you by Alatura Naturals. 
skincare. You guys loved the founder, Andy, when he came on this podcast to talk about his own healing journey after a tragic accident caused massive scarring on his face. From this experience, he developed some some of the most potent and effective natural skincare options from serums and masks and a lot of products in between. The results are super visible on his perfectly clear skin that is free of scars. I personally love the mask and I use it a couple times a week and I often use their gold serum at night to nourish my skin while I sleep. All of their products have super clean ingredients and they really work. Andy is absolutely dedicated to creating the highest quality products possible and it shows. You can check them out at alaturanaturals.com forward slash wellness mama and use the discount code wellness to get 20% off. So again, that's Alatura Naturals. So A L I T U R A N A T U R A L S dot com forward slash wellness mama and the discount code wellness to save 20%. And you talk a lot about uh, something called health span. And I would love if you could define what that is and then walk us through some of the factors that from what you've seen most impact health span. I'm assuming obviously the fasting mimicking diet or some version of that would be a tremendous one, but are there other things that you found in your research that also can really affect health span? Yes. So so in the book, I talk about two things. Uh, One is youth span and the other one is health span. So I talk about juventology um, and, and youth span, meaning that, you know, what is the period of life where we remain young? Uh, and so where you have maximum performance. And, and the idea is to extend it. Now you could claim that based on, let's say, Olympic athletes and, and, and professional athletes, that's about 40, right? So most people can perform at very high levels until age 40. Uh, but the idea is can we push that youth span, the period in which you remain young, to 60, maybe 70? And then after that, what about health span, meaning that, what is the period that you're no longer young, but you're healthy? Um, and that's uh, in the United States and Europe. This is largely disappearing. Most people have a chronic disease, if not multiple chronic diseases after a certain age. Uh, but so the idea we know that it's possible to now increase dramatically the, the percentage of people that can be healthy uh, until very old age or, or possibly healthy until they actually die, right? So you you um, you die healthy. And what does that mean? Uh, you know, it, it means that you know, one, if you at age eighty five you develop Alzheimer, you're not going to die healthy. If at, the, at age sixty seven you develop a chronic heart disease, you're not going to die healthy, um, or, or cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the idea is then, can you eventually die when you're one hundred and ten of the flu? Right. That's that's uh, really. Um, health span, right? So now you're 110, like Emma Morano and Salvatore Caruso, the people that I follow, both of them, male and female, uh, made it to over 110, and they were healthy, uh, meaning that they didn't have any chronic disease, and eventually they both died of of probably um, infections, um, but that's okay. I mean, eventually you're going to have to die of something, but uh, that's really great that they could make it to 110, one, and the 117, the other, without chronic diseases. And really, that's uh, what we're focusing on. And, and I think because of the confusion out there, nobody is, is doing the right thing. So what are the right things? Well, uh, in, the, in my book, I divide it into two. And half of it is about what do you do every day. And, and, and every day, you, the best diet seems to be a pescatarian, vegan, plus some fish, maybe fish a couple of times a week diet. Um, and the fish should be you know, low mercury. So you know, let's say salmon, anchovies, sardines, that seems to be, um, you know, a couple of times a week and, and seafood is also fine, plus vegan. Right? And, and vegan, where do you get the protein as well? Legumes uh, have a good level of protein, so uh, chickpeas and, 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 uh, and black beans, et cetera, et cetera. But people need to pay attention, right? When you, when you are mostly vegan and you eat fish a couple of times a week, you have to make sure that people don't realize that it takes about, Three or 400 grams of, of chickpeas to get 30 or 40 grams of proteins. Uh, so yeah, the portions need to be fairly large. And, and this is why I also talk in the book about eat more, not eat less. So every day eat more, but your, your dish is now going to look like 30, 40, 50 grams of, let's say, one or two ounces of pasta. But then now you have 
300 grams or, or you know, whatever, five ounces uh, or, or actually seven ounces of chickpeas and then, let's say, vegetables. So it's a large dish, high nourishment that is going to fill your stomach with fibers, et cetera, and, and, and make you not hungry um, for, for hours and hours. So that, that's the way to go. Um, the other uh, strategy every day is uh, limit the food intake to 12 hours. So 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, so eat 8 a.m., 8 p.m. People say, well, but I get up at 6. Uh, what, what, uh, how can I do that? And, well, you know, if you get up at 6 and you have dinner at 8 p.m., uh, don't have breakfast until 8 a.m. That's okay. You know, you know uh, have a couple of hours, go by, and then have breakfast at 8 a.m. So you can keep it 12 hours a day, the, the feeding period. Also, I recommend moving to two meals a day plus a snack for people that are overweight and obese. Uh, this idea of five meals, six meals a day has done, I think, tremendous damage and has been associated with a record uh, increase in obesity and, and people overweight, are now over 70% in the United States. And so move back to the old, what lots of centenarians used to do, you know, eat a couple times a day and maybe have a snack. So you have breakfast, always have breakfast, and then they eat a lunch and dinner or dinner and then have a snack, maybe a couple hundred calories coming from a salad or or, or some nuts or, or et cetera, for that's your third meal until you move to a better weight and then you can move back to the uh, three meals a day plus a snack. Yeah, then, you know, exercise, uh, um, I talk about 150 minutes a week and try to walk maybe an hour a day. Uh, that seems to be important. Uh, you know, stay active and, uh, and try to have maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes a, a week of a little bit more strenuous exercise so where you you push yourself you know depending on your age and your conditions but you push yourself a little bit more uh struggle a little bit and this that seems to be uh, important in the um in staying healthy uh and then the fasting making diet fasting making diet at least up, up to age 65 70 couple of times a year to 12 times a year so if you are a 35 year old athlete uh, has got, uh, with a pescatarian diet you might only need to do the, the fasting making diet, which is called Prolon in the U.S., a um, couple of times a year. And, uh, but if you're overweight or obese and you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, you may have some inflammatory, uh, high inflammatory markers, then probably a fasting making diet uh, uh, once a month for, um, until you move to a better state. And then at that point, you can go once every two months, once every three months, and eventually, let's say, once every four to six months. I would say, on average, uh, the, an American uh, probably need to do it uh, three times a year. Got it. Those are great guidelines. And to circle back to something you mentioned earlier, uh, you talked a little bit about sugar in relation to cancer specifically and, and uh, IGF-1. But I'm curious if you could go a little deeper on sugar specifically, because I've taken a lot of heat for writing and saying that, especially like with my kids and in general, that we don't have a biological need ever for refined or added sugar. And I've taken a lot of heat for that. And people you know, are like very much all things in moderation. So I'm curious, like, am I wrong on this? Or what does the do- data actually say? And what have you found in your research regarding sugar? I think uh, people confuse an item like sugar with the problem, which is excess sugar, right? So, so I think that in general, um, you know, fruit has sugar in it and, and lots of it. And so having a fruit a day is perfectly fine. Let's say an apple a day or an orange a day or, or whatever. Now, if you start even with fruit, you're starting to have five oranges a day or five apples. You're starting to get a lot, lots of lots of sugar from from those apples. Now, you, let's say that on top of that, you start having lots of bread, rice, and pasta, etc. All of that becomes sugar, right? So, I think the problem is not so much. Let's say I always tell people, go ahead and put sugar in your coffee. It's four grams. It's not going to do anything at all. But watch out about you know drinking a liter of or a big bottle of orange juice every day, right? Because now that contains a hundred grams of sugar. Yeah, so I think that we really need to uh, try to keep uh, refined sugar a- as low as possible, and um, but without feeling like that po- that's poison because we are fueled by sugar, right? So our the human body. Uh, works the, the the major fuel is sugar, but what happens in a lot of uh, in most Americans, in fact, is that 
you know, the levels of the average level of sugar uh, is high. And that's when um, then uh, the, the body needs to struggle to make more insulin. Uh, and insulin now eventually promotes insulin resistance. So the, the muscle cells and the adipocytes, they become, they struggle to bring in glucose. And the insulin is also giving the message to the liver and to the, the fat cells in general, store more fat. So all that process is clearly influenced, not just by pure sugar, but also by the, the starches, the pasta, the bread, the rice, uh, the pizza, right? So all those starches are uh, very quickly turned into sugar once, you, um, once they get to the intestine. And so those are going to eventually contribute to lots of problems, uh, including weight gain, insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera. So... So the best way to do it is, is what I said earlier, which is, you know, if you want to have an apple a day or even have some, uh, something that's got a little bit of sugar, a few grams of it, go ahead and do it. It, it. We need to be careful not demonizing these ingredients, you know. So if um, uh, the child wants to have, you know, uh, some a cake that it's got, you know, 12 grams of sugar, I think it's perfectly fine. What's not fine is to, uh, you know, have three cokes a day, and then three apples, and then, you know, some orange juice, and then the candy. Uh, now, all of a sudden, you went from 12 grams to 150 grams. And that child is, is going to be at risk for developing uh, visceral adiposity and being overweight, and then, you know, developing all the problems that most Americans have. That makes sense. And so in other words, basically, we can get the carbohydrates our body needs from things like fruit and sweet potatoes and vegetables, um, but you don't see anything wrong with the occasional like dark chocolate or something that would contain sugar. Just it's about the amount, essentially. Yeah. And, and people should be very careful about the amount because otherwise, you know, I, I also don't want to give the message, oh, don't worry so much about it. Yeah, worry about it because pay attention. You know, if you're a parent, pay attention because uh, you want to try to limit those simple sugar to very low levels. And you also want to say, hey, yeah, one apple, perfectly fine. Maybe two apples, that's okay. If, they, they, if you have a, a child that is very thin, uh, that's okay. But don't uh, uh, you know, implement this empty uh, sugar calorie uh, diet because eventually uh, it's going to be a problem. And the problem may not occur until somebody turns 37, right? So they may have a fairly high metabolism and can drink coke all day and they're fine. And then eventually uh, the metabolism slows or they, they reach a, a level of, of abdominal fat that changes uh, the metabolism. And now they start gaining a lot of weight. And you know, that's what happened with most people. They're fine until a certain age. And then they turn overweight and obese uh, later in life and they can never get rid of that. Got it. That's a great guideline. And I'm curious, as we get close to the end of our time, so you're in a lab on the forefront of actual research, and you're seeing a lot of the research across the board as well. I know you also do a lot of research. Um, what topics can we expect to hear more about in the future as they relate to health? I think that, that we, we, we can expect to hear uh, much more, you know, for example, as I was mentioning, the fasting making diets, uh, we're going to need to focus much more on the exactly what you do and when. Right? So, so much less of these words, you know, for example, you hear commercials, high protein, this 20 grams of protein, 30 grams of protein. I mean, of course, that's extremely damaging. Uh, well, first of all, because it's uh, uh, talking about you know, high protein and, and um, uh, when you should be talking about low protein. And, and also because it's trying to um, give sort of medical recommendation or certainly make a recommendation to come from a dietitian. We're now seeing it on, on the commercials. Uh, so they have, um, you know, they're implying health benefits, right? So all these commercials that you hear, you know, when somebody says, oh, 20 grams of protein, what are they saying? Well, they're saying eat lots of protein because it's good for you, right? And uh, so that's very bad. The, 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 the tremendous damage coming from that, and that's got to change. And I hope that people uh, are starting are going to start demanding that we have less confusion and less people uh, going on TV or on the radio or on the internet and improvising with with opinion, and more people that are really paying attention to you know what 
do we really know, right? And who is the expert that is accountable for it? And um, you know, I always say, for example, almost everybody flies on, on Boeing or Airbus, and uh, and there is a reason for that. I mean, you know, we we heard some problems lately, but in general, these companies have an incredible uh, safety record. Uh, very very few planes uh, crash. So I think we need to do the same for for food and nutrition, and um, and really have the the rely on the experts that seem to get it get it right. And they also have responsibility. You know, they're they're in centers that where we're you know, for example, I'm I'm, I'm a director of longevity institute here at USC, so I have accountability. If I say low protein diet is, is good for you, and then I'm proven wrong by paper after paper after paper. Uh, eventually, uh, that's my accountability. I got it all wrong. And so how is it that I got it all wrong? Should I be keep uh, giving advices to people, right? Maybe not. Right? So if that was the case, uh, that would be a fair, a fair uh, assessment. And, and, and it should be like that for everybody. And so I think uh, I really hope that uh, uh, with uh, um, you know, blogs like yours and, and, and many others, um, that we can start moving in that direction of uh, separating ideas uh, from uh, you know real science, real clinical data, and also accountability and reputation. You know, so all of those should be uh, kept in mind when when deciding uh, who do I expose my uh, listeners uh, to and, and why. That's a great point. I think you're spot on. And um, as we start to wrap up, I would also love if you could give people kind of a starting point to keep learning more from you. I, personally, I would highly recommend your book, The Longevity Diet, and I'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes and on social media so people can find it. But if someone has been listening and uh, like really understanding what you're saying and wanting to get into fasting mimicking diets, what would you recommend as a good starting point in general? Like, are there any good just general guidelines for someone who doesn't necessarily have cancer or a specific condition, but just wants to start getting the benefits? Yeah, I think, you know, the, 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 there is a, um, a prolong, uh, uh, it's called fasting mimicking diet and, and people can purchase it. And I, I don't make a penny out of it. I, I donate everything to uh, charity and to research. But um, yeah, people can go. I think it's Prolon FMD, and they can uh, and they can get it there. And uh, uh, and that's the one for healthy people. Uh, then um, soon enough, uh, there's going to be a uh, fasting mimicking diet uh, for cancer patients. Uh, the the uh, initial clinical trials are, are finished, so I hope that in a few months uh, there's going to be that uh, out, so people can start benefiting. Uh, and getting the benefits that we've seen in the clinical trials for for cancer, um, you know, and uh, soon enough, you know, we're doing trials now. We have, I think, uh, over thirty clinical trials going, uh, go from many cancer trials to to Alzheimer to multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, that uh, those are going to be out. And uh, understanding that lots of people cannot wait for for uh, one of these many trials to be finished. Then I recommend the book, and I recommend, as we've done with thousands and thousands of patients, uh, you can take it to your doctor. Let's say somebody has an autoimmunity, and they say, well, you know, uh, I don't think I can wait. Take the book, read it, go to your, uh, or your gastroenterologist and say, I don't think I can wait. Uh, does the gastroenterologist agree that maybe it's worth uh, trying the fasting making diet, maybe together with the standard of care, and, um, and see if that helps? in a very careful manner. And, um, and um, yeah, so then that, that's probably a, a, good, uh, a good way to approach this. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Longo, thank you so much for all of the work that you do and for your dedication to this field of research. I, like I said, I've been a fan of yours for a really long time, and I'm so grateful you took the time to share with us today. And I'll make sure that people have links to find your research and your books to continue learning. But thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for listening. And I hope you'll join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast. If you're enjoying these interviews, would you please take two minutes to leave a rating or review on iTunes for me? Doing this helps more people to find the podcast, which means even more moms and families can benefit from the information. I really appreciate your time. And thanks as always for listening.